And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Handiwork Games, and the cre and, I'm a and a man who... It who is who is um, well versed in time zone hell just as much as I am the one the one and only the man formerly known as Morg Morgan D and creator of a state now reaching its second edition thanks it as a forged in the dark project the one and only Morgan Davy how are you doing today man or I'm doing really well hi well today well today for you not for me <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's right um i'm down in new zealand so uh middle of a day and i understand where you are the the sky is darkening is that right mm -hmm. yeah um well it's good to talk to you mildra yeah so th thank you thank you for thank you for coming on um and so i'll start i'll start with the hum i'll start with the usual tradition of the humble beginnings as i often do here um I'd like well it's by my aunt it's fiction and that sort of thing she likes to share things with my older brother and and me and she um put down in front of us one day a copy of the very first printing of Warlock of Firetop Mountain, the first fighting fantasy book. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a, had a nice time playing through that and trying to... Uh, it took me a while to figure out what was going on with that when, when you're eight years old and you don't really have any models for that kind of branching narrative. That was, that was something. But then not long after that, she sat us down and um, we, we got to play Dungeons & Dragons with her and her partner. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we played um, basic D&D. &D. It was the um, Moldvay edition of D&D, &D, and it was the uh, In Search of the Unknown adventure where you, you're entering this old fortress controlled by uh, Rogan and Zaligar. And there's this amazing entrance corridor where you will basically walk down a straight line for a long way, and these um, magical mouths pop up on either side of the corridor and yell at you for daring to enter the place. And I have these vivid memories of sitting at the table and holding this character sheet that I didn't really understand and listening to my uncle describe walking down this, this corridor and hearing these mouths and kind of getting a sense of how this was meant to work, but still not, not quite getting it. And we got to the end of this corridor. If you, if you have this module, you can pull it out and look mm -hmm. at the map. You get to the end of the corridor and there's this crossroads where a battle had taken place. So there's dead bodies everywhere. And so my uncle described that there was this carnage around the place. And I was like, oh, okay, all right, that's a, that's a thing. And then right through the next door, there is a big kitchen area with a great big cauldron. And as soon as my uncle mentioned the, the cauldron, my aunt playing her character, who had reacted to all the carnage, she described going over to the cauldron and throwing up into it because she was, she was so sickened by what she'd seen. And I just remember listening to that moment listening to her describe that in my, in my mind's eye i could i could see what happened and suddenly it all clicked everything clicked that this was a this was a game where you could do anything you just talked through the description of this experience and you could explore things and react and and throw up into a into a cauldron and it, it just all immediately made sense and so that was that's like my entire origin story is that one long corridor that my character walked down and at the end completely just dove into the game and running it for my friends Uh, now, now given now given that, um, and and thank and thank you for clarifying that you that it was the mold of a um, um, o, um O D and D because, well, <sighs> trying trying to keep trying to trying to keep track of of which of which version of the original can be a bit um annoying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's like there's yeah. like five of them. Yeah, they sure are. They sure are. Um. And uh, and as somebody who as somebody who likes to keep who likes to keep um, editions in chronological order, it's interesting. 
<laughs> I'll put it. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it that way. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's it is it's it was a pretty interesting time in the development of D and D that they kind of were coming up with all these these variations on the same theme, and every few years they they put out a new edition of the basic rules or a um they'd update something else, and they all played slightly different. So every every one of the versions of the games back then they kind of all worked together. So that if you sit down and you've been playing one and you sit down to play at a table doing the other, you'd, you'd be able to keep up and know what was going on. But they, they're all a little bit different. So um, it's, been, it's been interesting to, to try them all. More recently, I've, I've uh, had the opportunity to go back and try some of the earlier editions of the game that I'd never really dug into. So I, I still need to go back to the white box. I've got a copy of the white box rules, the original rules, but I've never sat down to play them. So that's one of the things that I'm hoping to do in the next couple of years. Give that a, give that a good go. The really old school. Yeah. Um, I, ha- I, ha- I have, I have, I have tooled about with white box and I've, and I've tooled about with, um, it's, it's, um, successors. Um, mm-hmm. But I do have to ask: Did you ha- did you have proper dice, or did you have those old crayon dice that everybody that everybody hates? <laughs> we had the old the old crayon dice. That was um, what came out in those in those sets, and I've still got some of those dice in my in my pile today. A lot of them have disappeared down the back of couches over the over the many years that have passed since then. Um, but yeah, I have a lot of fondness for them, especially for, and I'm so gutted that I cannot find it at the moment. I refuse to believe that it's lost forever, but the blue 20 sided dice from one of those Moldvay sets mm-hmm. was infamous in my 20 over and over and over again. And I'm sure it's because of the, like it was, they were so soft, those dice. I'm sure the edges got shaved off. I really believe that it just is not a true dice anymore. It's not, it's not a fair rolling dice, but it came up 20 far too many times so whenever i pulled that one out of the dice bag all of my players would groan because old blue was going to kill someone which happened happened more than once more than once so yeah i love those old dice Mm -hmm. (laughs) um that's the first time i've heard a i've heard a story about a blessed dice (laughs) normally when it comes to dice i hear them about be about them being cursed yeah yeah although although i'm pretty sure that's a matter of perspective so maybe blurst um <laughs> yeah that is that is very true i have as um most kind of perennial dms will attest whenever i sit down to play my dice do not tend to roll nearly as well as they do when i'm trying to cause mayhem for uh for a bunch of player characters as a dungeon master so yeah, yeah. well one of the mantras here in the temple is the dice gods show no mercy yeah Oh, <laughs> and I and they're in my opinion they're a model of a of equality because it does not matter your age, occupation, country of origin, um, gender, gender orientation, what have you. The dice got not be uh, assuaged by anything. There's always another natural one waiting around the corner for you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I think that's the I think that's the reason why. Um, you know, you've probably heard the adage there are no there are no atheists in foxholes. Yeah, I think that I think that can apply with with um, tabletop gaming. <laughs> every, <laughs> even if even if nobody's outwardly religious, everybody's got their own little superstitions and the things that you don't do. Yeah. Um, yeah. In in our case, it was it was everybody brings their own dice. You don't t- you don't touch anyone else's dice. Yeah. Um. But that br- now that brings me to the f- to um a state. Um, mm-hmm. Now, what before we before we get into the second edition, I'd like to get into the origins of the f- of the first mm-hmm. and. What what pro- what prompted the the um the idea of the th- of the city because that because that ki- that kind of that kind of dis- that kind of urban dystopia is very is as far is as far removed as you can get from doing high f- from doing a high or even sword and sorcery tile f- type of fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a state was a <clears throat> state was created. 
by uh, Malcolm Craig and Paul Bourne over in Scotland. And um, uh, I've I've spoken to Malcolm about where the original ideas for the game came from, and it just seems like it was this this thick soup of influences in the 90s films like uh dark city and city of lost children Mm -hmm. um political things that were happening at the time in the the waning days of the of the thatcher years and um kind of the alienation amongst um people and society kind of becoming a bit more um well a, a bit broken i guess over in the uk um some of the uh just the nature of being in these these big urban cities london and and uh glasgow with their um the difficulties that uh begin to establish themselves when you're dealing with um dealing with uh poverty operating through those cities and um how crime works and how community operates and so he was kind of just assembling all of this stuff in his head at the same time as playing a bunch of games he he played a lot of uh i think twilight 2000 was one of his early games that he played he played um uh uh, slay industries i'm pretty sure he played that it gets compared a lot to uh to a state i'm not entirely sure of how the the timeline fits for him but he's with like with slay um so I, i think it all just kind of assembled out of almost out of nowhere into this vision of a of a giant city Mm-hmm. and uh, a place in that city called Meyer End was the first thing that he he started imagining in, in some detail this kind of um, grimy tenement um, a grimy place full of tenements where there was always water on the ground because it never never quite drained away and um, people would just be struggling to to get through the day and the night and um, from this kind of dismal um setting he somehow managed to envisage how it could be a great place to explore through play a great um opportunity to uh kind of deal with those pressures those those intense urban environments and maybe look at um making things better for people so the idea of fixing things and improving things in small ways was there right from the beginning and and it appeared in the first version of the game mm-hmm. as uh, um something they they had some rules about engendering hope in the community and you'd get kind of ex- experience points basically for um doing a good job at bringing hope into the community so all of this was churning and churning and he made contact with um paul Bourne, a friend of his who was really good at digital art and started taking these ideas that malcolm had and bringing them to um life as these amazing digital art pieces and so paul is rightly considered a co-creator with malcolm of of the city and between the two of them kind of bouncing back and forth with Paul's art and Malcolm's writing. And then they collaborated on a lot of ideas. Um, a lot of the sense of humor of the game comes from the two of them sitting down and talking. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot from both of them that's right at the, at the ground level of the, of the city. And it's a, it's a really vivid creation. It's really, um, I think it's, it's quite unique. It's quite a, a fascinating piece of um, world building. Yeah. And when when it comes now, given given that, and I can definitely see the Dark City um, comparisons, which is one is one of my favorite movies or, of that particular era. Mm. Um, one th- one thing that I find kind of kind of amusing, just from my perspective, is the is the games that he was playing that may have been an influence that you had mentioned. That being um, Twilight Two Thousand and um, Slay Industries, which. Mm. Amusingly enough, both of them are coming. Both of them are in the process of coming back. Yeah. yeah. Um, Slay in, Slay Industries is, has has come has come back with a new edition recently, and um, Twilight Two Thousand is getting a new edition thanks to Free League. Yeah, that's right. Um. Although although Slay uh, although go although what en- what what A State ended up being and and. Slay Industries being in, being an inspiration is amusing to me because of how much Slay Industries is um, black humor. <laughs> mm. um, I wouldn't I wouldn't say black humor. I'd say it's the kind of humor that you'd see in um, 2000 AD. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very much so. I, I I have to be careful that I don't um, I don't overstate mm. the influence things because I don't I don't really know that Malcolm would credit Slay as an as an influence. It might be more of a parallel development thing. Um, but you can you can kind of see that same 
um, kind of baroque, huge, sprawling urban thing shot through with dark humor mm-hmm. in both of those both of those games. And yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, as you say, Slay wears its um, its kind of satirical, funny thing right on its sleeve, like that those 2000 AD strips. It's yeah, yeah. I it's have quite I have something. To, I br- I bring up to I bring up to. It's whenever whenever talking about 2000 AD, it's tempting to just focus on ju- on Judge Dread, but I feel like that mm. does the I, that does that particular magazine a, a bit of a disservice. I mean, yeah, as much there's, as a, I, there's a lot of interesting a lot of interesting stuff has come out of 2000 AD over the years. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, but get but shifting shifting from that to to second edition, which is which is where. You at which is where you and yours um, come in. Mm-hmm. Um, how how did you how did you get how did you um come how did you come across a state with the first time and and walk me through the events leading to um the creation of a second edition. Right. So, um, personally speaking, I connected with a state basically on its uh, on its launch day at its um, very first release at uh, Compulsion, a convention in Edinburgh, Scotland. I was there and um, bought a copy and talked to Malcolm and talked to the, the other people that were um, there selling the game. And um, I, I knew Malcolm a little bit before that from um, Game Society in Edinburgh. This was I was living in Scotland at the time. I lived in Scotland for a few years. And um, over over the time that I was there, we became really good friends and did a lot of um, a lot of social stuff together, a lot of gaming together. And as part of that, I had a lot of conversations with Malcolm about A State, and um, had uh, between the two of us, we we had some interesting conversations about where the game might go next and um, what might be coming ahead. We went to um, Gen Con together in two thousand five. And I vividly remember going on a bus ride with him after that, where um, he was uh, shooting out some ideas for how a second edition of A State might look, being um, infused with some of the ideas for dif- different rules approaches that have sprung up through the indie game scene in the intervening couple of years. Um, so there were some really, really cool thoughts that he had there, and um, I had some some good thoughts myself about things that we could do with the setting and do with the game and so um my name was uh i I appeared in one of the um what was it called the circular which was the the games group that were operating around a state they released this little online magazine Mm -hmm. and it talked about what was coming for a state and it said that uh morgan Morgan davies going to be doing something for a state soon um and so that was i think in 2006 or 2007 so it took took um well over a decade for that to come to fruition when we um kind of came back around to looking at a state second edition as a possibility mm-hmm. and so the second edition came um mostly from gregor hutton um he's a he's an amazingly accomplished game designer he's um got a really fascinating brain he's he can just assemble things together in really exciting ways and uh, approaches from kind of this this lateral thinking angle that I found really refreshing. And so he was looking at Blades in the Dark, John Harper's game, um, kind of about criminals working in this this grimy urban setting and and kind of fighting to establish themselves. And he um, had a conversation with John Hodgson of Handiwork Games and said, you know, Blades in the Dark would work really without much tweaking for A-State. And that kind of started a little um, germ of an idea going around. And then John went and had a word with Malcolm, um, who had left the gaming industry by that that point and was um, full on into the academic life, where um, he's a very busy academic these days. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, against kind of everyone's expectations, Malcolm was quite keen to put A State back on the agenda. And so the wheels started turning and took a little while for us to line up the team properly and um, get the approach that we wanted to take to it all in mind. But yeah, suddenly we, we just had this project that was that was a go. We were going to be doing A-State. It was going to be a new edition of the game. Um, Malcolm was going to be involved. Gregor and I were going to be leading the rules and we were going to be using Blades in the Dark as our, as our uh, starting point and elaborating from there. And um, John at Handiwork helpfully had also brought in Paul Bourne because mm-hmm. um, they'd worked together for years at Cubicle 7. 
So John um, and Paul were already working together at Handiwork, and so Paul naturally just fell right back into the A State world that he'd co-created. So um, yeah, we were we were kind of ready to go, and the project got moving from there. Mm -hmm. Now, when now when it comes to when it comes to that si that system using mm -hmm. <clears throat> using blade using blades in the dark, which um, I will admit as an, I will admit as an as an aside when I whenever I look at the blades in the dark setting, I'm I'm sitting near. I just end, I just end up making the gag of you got you guys are you guys are totally completely absolutely not thief. <laughs> you are legally distinct, the best kind yep. of distinct. But let <laughs> but let's not kid ourselves. It's it's if if a character named Garrett showed up in the fiction, I w I would just roll my eyes. <laughs> um, but but give and to be and to be fair. Given that, given that, um, Blades in the Dark's default setting is, is is in that is in that kind of, um, in that kind of ur in that kind of urban he hell, um, mm. urban jungle kind of se kind of setup, it is an it is a natural switch to go from that to the city. Yeah. Um, if I if I, I and when it comes to the city, I will admit that one of the other one of the other things that came to mind whenever i'd see, whenever i'd see it described is um so is some of the sf art that mobius would do as well as stuff like transmetropolitan which is one of my all-time favorite um comic comic series yeah yeah um yeah yeah mobius is actually a, that's a really good reference that hasn't i don't think anyone's mentioned that to me before but i can totally see it those cityscapes that that mobius does uh mm -hmm. um yeah yeah yeah, that's and, a good idea. Well, th those particular cityscapes were were the were the um pri were one of the primary influences for um, Akira and Blade Runner. Mm. Um, I don't I don't know how direct it was in the case of Akira, but in the case of Blade Runner, I know that Ridley Scott um, showed his art showed his art team um, um, images of images of those cityscapes from um, the pages of Heavy Metal magazine. And said, yeah. "I want, I want this kind of look." Um, but when now, when it comes to the when it comes to the setup that you have with Blades in the Dark, there's def there's definitely you definitely have a a solid foundation to transfer. But as I under, as I understand it, um, much like much like some other Forged in the Dark projects, there are going there are a few monkey wrenches thrown into how the setup works. And I'd, li I'd like to go into some of those. What are some of what are some of the mechanic old changes that um, that are in a that are in a state to reflect its setting versus mm. the default setup for um, Blades in the Dark? Yeah. Well, the um, I think maybe the the first thing that we should talk about is the uh, the obvious thing for any Blades character is the list of actions that you have that you can perform and. Um, in Blades in the Dark, um, it's uh, oh, I'm blanking on the I'm blanking on the list. Um, there's uh, ones like skirmish and um, prowl and attune to the kind of the weirdness that's going on in the in the city. So each of these verbs is something that you can use to uh, to do whatever it is that you're trying to do in the game. And so when we we're sitting down for a state, we um, were wondering how many of those verbs we would take over to our version of the game. So we released a um, kind of a, a quick start a tester called um, A State Nicely Done uh, about a year ago. And it's uh, it's any nominated right now. It's, um, it's a beautiful little introduction to the city. And that's designed to be played mostly using Blades in the Dark rules, but with a few little tweaks. And it shows the first of those changes that we made, which was to swap out the attune verb with one that we thought was really essential to our approach to what ASTEC was about and what the city was about, which is the the verb care. So um, we want the characters in our um, our game to be working for the people around them in their little corner of the city. We want them to be trying to help that little community to prosper in the face of all kinds of forces that are trying to break them down and tear them apart so 
um, caring for each other and caring for the people around you is is something that's really important to action in a state in a way that it's not in Blades in the Dark, where the premise of the game is that you're you're essentially criminals and um, you're working together because you you're a team and you're faced with significant threats, but you're not really trying to care for anyone apart from your own um, your own pile of loot that you're accumulating over time. So um, we we ended up going through that list of verbs in some detail as we got further into development, and one by one they got swapped out for slightly different phrasings or quite significant changes. Um, but the, I think that iconic switch of bringing bringing in care as a um, really important part of the game, um, I think that was really important to us. So it's a game where your ability to care is it's as important as your ability to fight. Um, I think that says a lot about the city and it says a lot about our approach to the kind of the grimness of the setting. Now, with... As a bit as a bit of a as a bit of a follow up to that, um, mm-hmm. like as some one thing that I did find in, one thing that I did find interesting is the um, is the di- is the die setup that you have. Um, mm-hmm. Blades in the Dark is st- is still v- still very much wears it's powered by the apocalypse on its sleeve, but and because and if I and it, it's been a while, but I recall it doing the whole the whole setup of of um. Of ro- of rolling t- rolling two dice, then the, then the modifiers and all that. Actually, you know what I I take that, but I take I I take that slight I take that slightly back because that because um that's but because that's not the case. It was it wasn't an early edition, but in my defense, I was on the old I was on the old Google Plus forums for Blades. Um, oh right, yeah. I think I think very early Blades was was like that in its earliest iterations. Yeah. 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 But instead, 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 its current form is the whole roll a bu- roll a bunch d six, keep the keep the highest, and yeah. depending on how that rolls is how is how is the result that you're going to have. Um, yeah. But as uh, uh, but since you met since you mentioned that there were certain um, certain ver- certain verbs that you wanted to make sure were compatible, um, mm. were there were there any Aside from attunement, which is uh, which is fairly obvious, were there any that um, that you that you felt weren't going to be compatible with a state that you that come to mind? Oh, um, I wish I could answer this one off the top of my head. I um, hmm, I just don't have a clear enough picture in my head to 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 compare the two. Um, but I know that we went through a lot of iterations and a lot of um, explorations of the of the different ways that we could break down um, the elements of the game. Uh, let me think. Yeah, no, I'm I'm struggling to I'm struggling to summon it. It was it was quite a long time ago when we were diving into these conversations, and I've just kind of been living in a state land since. So, um, I I don't have the the um, the references, but I think none of the none of the blades verbs were entirely inappropriate, but they were all just a little bit um, a little bit not quite lined up to where we wanted a state to be and then when you start shifting one thing around then it ends up shifting another thing around because it, mm-hmm. it nudges into the space the the verbs all kind of overlap with each other a, a little bit here and a little bit there so um it was yeah almost like a chain of dominoes that we started changing one thing and then we had to change change the next um yeah, like we took away we took away prowl and um, we've got sneak in there, which is the uh, um, it's kind of a it's a bit of a more conventional RPG term for um, sneaking around and avoiding notice. But some of the the associations of prowl with um, kind of moving through the city were they just weren't quite aligned with where we thought that a state was going to be. So we took prowl out, we put sneak in, and the kind of moving around skillfully aspects of prowl are um uh, covered off in other verbs 
So it's you're you're kind of doing surgery to to make the words cover just the right sorts of things. Um, we've got pages and pages of notes that we we made to each other as we were working through it. Now, with the with that can, with that in mind, yeah, the I'd obviously obviously one of the key things that's go, that's going to be explored in. Uh, in any in any sort of Blades in the Dark or Forge in the Dark project is going to be the playbooks. That's going to be the most forward facing um, thing with thing within the setup. Mm -hmm. And with with that with that in mind, I'd I'd like to I'd like to kind I'd like to kind of go th kind of go through the um, the playbooks that the playbooks that are available. Mm -hmm. And ju and just get and just get your just get your take on the on the vibe that it's that each is supposed to be going for and what sort of what sort what sort of what sort of care what sort of archetype that they would fall into. Right. Um, okay. So I'll start at the top with the activist. Um, so the activist is a um, kind of a rebel rouser uh, who who's trying to make change happen in the community, usually um, through um, through talking, through persuasion, through making a point. Um, but there's also some um, disruptive stuff going on in there. Um, activists can uh, easily specialize in breaking things and uh, tearing things down because that's that's part of stopping bad things from happening to the community so there's kind of a two-pronged approach that you can you can get in there as an activist you can um be out in front of protests yelling at people and uh stirring up action or you can be running around after dark um with uh wire cutters in order to um deal with problems that way mm -hmm. so next would be, next would be the dingen smith Try saying that five times fast. <laughs> um, so that's that's your uh, your kind of tech person and and crafter. Um, the the dungeons are a kind of little clockwork clockwork computers basically, mm -hmm. and they they are operating inside a lot of the technology that's that's working in the city. So the city is this kind of tech mix of um kind of edwardian victorian era um society uh early industrial age stuff but there's all of this um kind of clockwork higher tech that's running through it and is concentrated in the elite areas so you have um kind of the equivalent of television you have the equivalent of um advanced processing by uh by computers and um there's a uh, big kind of information network that runs through the through the city that is used by the um the powerful trusts to um manage all of their information and control people so um yeah there's, there's kind of a lot of space for um people on the corner to get access to higher tech stuff by um just grabbing materials from whatever repositories they can get hold of and then crafting it into interesting and more elaborate devices than uh, would normally be available. So for that kind of uh, crafting and tech development, um, that's what the, the Dungeon Swiss, uh, can't even say it myself, what, that's what they are for. <laughs> yep. And <clears throat> next would be the Ghost Fighter. Mm-hmm. So the ghost fighter is the um, is the scary one of these uh, of these characters. The, the ghost fighter playbook is that's your your combat oriented playbook in in uh, in general. So there's other ways. Each of these playbooks you can kind of twist them in different ways and capture different archetypes mm -hmm. um, under that that general heading. Um, but the ghost fighter is um, basically a, a killer, a stealth assassin who um, they they operate through the city and they get contracts and they get where they need to be and they kill people mm -hmm. and they're very good at doing it and they're very skillful and they're very scary they like to get up close and they like to do it with a big long knife um so yeah the the ghost fighter is is the um hard character who 
uh, will be intimidating people and uh, cutting them if they need to get cut. Mm -hmm. So ne next is the Lost Finder. Um, so the Lost Finder is uh, an interesting contrast, I think, to the Ghost Fighter. The Lost Finder is a kind of community figurehead who operates by um they just they just work in a community and they seek out what is lost so they're good at finding stuff but they're also good at relating to people they're kind of the the private investigator of the setting only they are um they're, they're much more communally minded i think than the um private eye archetype of um kind of your daniel dashiell hammett um stories where they're, they're very much a loner who's operating in their in their own scene um, a lost finder is very engaged with the community around them so they have a lot of um, orientation towards working with communities and relying on people and helping people and um, also a bunch of stuff at finding what needs to be found because that's what the lost finder does they go out into the the crazy alleys and canals of the city and find whatever is missing and it's easy for stuff to get lost out there mm -hmm. uh Next would be the map maker. Mm -hmm. um, so your map maker is kind of your uh, your fixer, your negotiator, um, someone who understands the different factions that are at work in the city and how to bring them together and make sure everyone can walk away with what they need. So your high stakes negotiations, that's what your map maker is an expert at. So a big part of the game in second edition is kind of the faction game which is something that is inherited from the blades in the dark template there are a whole bunch of factions at work and as um as you play the game master is constantly um moving these pieces around in the background and sometimes in the foreground so the factions are struggling to achieve their own ends and they're messing with each other and they're messing with the corner where you live so a map maker is someone who can kind of navigate that maze of um con contradictory uh goals and find a find a pathway through it and help de-escalate situations before they they get out of hand so yeah map makers are good good negotiators good at spotting um spotting deceit and deception and um yeah good at at figuring out what people really want mm -hmm. <clears throat> the next would be the sneak thief so your sneak thief is um, your classic creeping around through the um, through the shadows and uh, taking what doesn't belong to them. There's a lot of um, a lot of theft in the city. There's a lot of criminal activity. So um, yeah, this is this is kind of your uh, um, sneaky crime playbook. Um, there's various ways that you can tune it but your your sneak thief as they they come in the playbook um kind of vanilla flavor is they're they're good at sneaking and they're good at using their hands and getting into places where they are not meant to be mm -hmm. um in in the context of a state's um work for the corner um they have kind of joined the alliance to help their local community um and their their skills at getting where they are not supposed to be and uplifting things that don't necessarily belong to them can be essential in terms of getting resources for your corner or um stopping uh trouble before it gets a chance to to get out of hand mm -hmm. uh, ne uh, next would be the stringer mm-hmm um so stringer is a, a media communicator um they are uh the stringer is is basically a journalist and the journalist role in um in this game is quite important because being able to control the messaging around your part of the city in the face of all of these these rival points of view is um it's a really handy way to uh kind of protect yourself and um go on the offense as well so it's a it's a media role you're good at, at um shaping messages getting things done um by doing 
uh, kind of doing outreach that's a weird word for it um but also very good at um investigating good at talking to people um good at going in public and um shaping a shaping a message to um the people that need to hear it um good at holding people to account by figuring out the um the lies that they have told and um kind of assembling networks of uh of informants and supporters around that um so yeah a stringer is oh also stringers um are good at fooling people that's the other important part of a stringer um if you're in media you need to be able to tell lies with a straight face so um yeah that's that's where you want to be if you're uh pretty keen on deceiving people all right um now the now let's now give now um given what given what you mentioned the first thing that came to mind was the was the um media type character type in um cyber in cyberpunk mm yeah um but one of the, one of the thing one of the one of the one of the major things that that you get that as i as i'm as i'm aware you guys are bringing to the table is put is putting in a whole system and chart for mat for mitigating risk um mm. i'd like you to go into how that idea came about and and what and what um and how it wor- how it works in play okay so uh in in the forged in the dark system that blaze in the dark began every time you you want to do anything every time you want to make a roll you take one of those those verbs that we've talked before and that'll give you a bunch of dice to roll but you also need to figure out your um kind of the situation that's that's happening in the fiction so in uh in blaze in the dark they call it position and effect and it's basically a gm's call they say if um you're in a difficult position or you're in a kind of a safe position or you're in a position of um kind of desperation and and real danger um the gm will say that and also the gm will say what the effect of your effort is going to be is it likely to if you succeed are you going to um get what you want right away or is it just going to kind of chip away at the the goal that you want are you going to be able to kick down the door right now or are you just going to be able to kind of bump it a little bit off its hinges Mm -hmm. so um when we sat down with this and we were working our way through our take on it we kind of refactored that into um risk and reward as our as our two axes which are similar to position and effect but just different enough that um they let us really focus in on the um the risk taking behavior that the the alliance of of troublemakers is undertaking in a state mm-hmm. so when you want to do something um it's the same same general structure as other forged in the dark games the player will say oh, well i'm going to be using my scrounge ability or i'm going to be using my fight ability and um the gm will say okay well i think right now you're in a risky situation but the reward is going to be um it's going to be a great reward or it's going to be a limited reward or whatever um we've got this lovely chart which appears in the book Mm-hmm. And a version of that is um, on a playmat add-on that we had with our Kickstarter that you can purchase separately. So you can have it kind of sitting on the table in front of you and have a physical object that sits there. Because after that assessment by the GM, that you then get the stage of negotiation. Um, first of all, where the players are like, you, you really think that's a, that's a great reward? I think it should be an extreme reward. Or, I, I, or you, you, do you think that should be a limited reward? I think it's more of a standard reward situation. And then you talk a little bit about how different people see the situation because of course when you, when you're playing a game like this everyone imagines things mm-hmm. slightly differently so you talk enough so that everyone's on the same page and it's like oh okay so it's that kind of door all right i get what's going on we're all on the same page about that so we have our um our um icon on the the map in that square that says it's standard reward and it's risky and then you can have all these little um manipulations that players can do they can um push themselves which bumps up the reward they're going to get so if i'm it's a standard reward now but i'm going to push myself i'm going to take some stress and then i move it up to great reward or um i'm going to uh trade um position and effect is what it's called in standard forged in the dark and we Mm -hmm. call it um just working with the risk and reward i'm going to um take more risk for greater reward so instead of it being standard reward and risky i'm going to move it up to 
great reward, but I'm in a desperate position. And every time you do one of those manipulations, you can take whatever the object is on the on the chart, um, and you can slide it to the the um, square that you're now in, so everyone can see where this negotiation is taking you. And then once you've gone through all of those steps, all of those negotiations, everyone should have a really clear image of what's happening in the fiction because you talked about it. Mm. Everyone knows what risks they have taken and what stress they have accumulated and exactly where you are sitting and then the dice come out and you roll the dice and you look at the highest result that you get and where that square was that tells you what the effect of the um the result is going to be if things go bad for you um you can see what what badness is going to come your way if you rolled well you can see what reward is going to be um arriving for you are you going to kick down that door after all um so yeah the, every every action in the game that chart kind of sums up the um uh, the whole negotiation the whole process and takes you through from the beginning through to the end of it it's something that uh we didn't invent whole cloth it came out of the work of a designer named paul beakley he's more of a more of a critic really mm -hmm. um uh he, he writes really smart smart stuff about um about games at a blog called the indie game role playing no the indie game reading club mm -hmm. indie game reading club and um he was writing about uh one of the forged in the dark games band of blades and um he said that he had developed this chart and was using it in his games and i just thought that was it was amazing so um we basically copied him and um made our own version and it's um it, yeah it's really taken off and it's been used quite a lot um, already, I think, in Blades in the Dark games where people on um, on the Blades in the Dark Reddit saw the, what we were doing in our Kickstarter and then have started developing their own versions for their own games. And, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of people using the chart now, which is really exciting to see. And I hope Paul is pleased at his idea spreading throughout the, throughout the Forged in the Dark world. Yeah. Now... <clears throat> A lot of t a lot of times in ur in urban settings or urban forms of storytelling, um, there's a there's a unspoken emphasis on the idea of the city as a, as a living thing. Sometimes sometimes this is far more literal than others, and some mm. and some and sometimes mm. the and sometimes the the city some and um, sometimes the city may as may as well be against you in one in or be against you or be manipulated in one form or another um looking at you dark city what was <laughs> what was giving me the idea of attacking someone with a building yeah. um but how how do you but given given the fact that this that being in the city and all and all of its myriad forms is going to be one of the central characters of any mission in a state how do you how do you carry in that idea of the city as a living thing hmm now that is a good question that is a good question the um the city in a state is it's i mean it's a fascinating environment because it is entirely closed off i, I don't think we've mentioned yet mm -hmm. um so for people who aren't familiar with a state it's it's a um a really big city that no one can leave there is um no one really knows what happens if you go beyond the bounds of the city, mm -hmm. but people disappear and they never come back. So everyone is kind of crammed into this this environment and, and it's just been seething in there for hundreds of years, um, kind of this real closed system, um, struggling struggling to survive and extract what, what is needed to survive from mines that go down and um, all kinds of these crazy contraptions that, that let people survive and there's this pretty awful environment so you're in this kind of this this real hot house where everyone is stuck together mm -hmm. and the city makes its presence known all the time i think through um just through the closeness of of people because it's so crowded and everything about um the the nature of the city is just carried through the different people and and the different factions and the communities that are are at work there wherever you go in the city you're going to be meeting the the local people there you're going to have to interact with the factions that are powerful there you're going to have to deal with the specific ways that community have worked out how to sustain themselves and how to get by 
not just materially but also kind of psychologically in the city um so in the in the final release book we're going to be having can't remember how many it is now we expanded it a bit through the um through the kickstarters like 20 20 something different locations maybe 30 um different locations in the city that will be um written up in some detail so wherever you go wherever your journeys take you you'll encounter a different um a different perspective on how people can survive in this urban environment um so i feel i feel that's one of the ways that you get the sense of the the living nature of the city that everyone is kind of expressing it through their own kind of solutions to the challenges of living there um i don't know if that's that's exactly hitting your question but it's it's the answer that my brain came up with so i'm going to stand by it <laughs> um you know if you know if i if i was a more professional po- podcast i would pro- i would probably tr- i would probably try and dig deep to get the specific answer that 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 i'm assumed to be looking for but i am not a professional <laughs> um, and given given that given that as i under- as i understand it one of the um a ki- a kind of a kind of o- a kind of opening act with ha- with how a- with how a state campaigns go is the- is this idea that um that people that a group of people are are um, shaken out of their particular their particular mo- mode of ju- of just trying to survive in the city because because some because something is happening to their particular corner. That's um, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like I'd like you to go into how that how that's represented short term and long term within um, a state. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, that's that's bang on the inciting incident for a game of a state is um, the the starting situation it's called in the game and it's part of character creation and uh and the game beginning process so you create your characters at the start and then um together as a group you create the corner that is the home for those characters the part of the city that um all of them call home and you figure out what factions are active there and what resources they have there and what problems are affecting that place um, everyone's kind of making choices and adding their own little contributions and building on each other's ideas. And the last thing that you do in that process is you decide what the immediate problem is that's landing on the place. So in the um, in the playtest preview, the starting situation that we we have there is where there are two factions that are at war and it's causing a problem. And so you go through it as a group and you decide um, what two factions that you've we've already heard about. Uh, having a basically having a big fight and how it's affecting the corner right now um and then after um that you you basically get given the first scene of the game which is that the struggle between these factions is causing an immediate problem and is risking some people in the city and that's the first scene where the the characters have to deal with that problem and in the aftermath of that Mm -hmm. they come together and they recognize that this problem is not going away there's a whole big big um big challenge that has arisen in this case these two factions are not going to stop fighting and the problems are not going to stop coming down so it's up to them to do something about it and so they make an alliance and um set out to try and deal with it and so that's what the game is is the work of this this group of people who might not have much in common they might even be rivals in a lot of ways their backing factions might be opposed to each other but they all live on this corner and they care about this corner and so they're going to put those differences aside as best they can and try and deal with this bigger problem that's hanging in the background so after you get through the the initial setup then we hand over to what's called the trouble engine and the trouble engine is something that runs kind of every every downtime every time there is a mission and the characters do something afterwards there's a bit of downtime where they can recuperate and in that time the gm runs the trouble engine and it's basically a bunch of charts and tables and inputs from things that have happened in the game and it spits out new problems and the problems might be coming just from the corner because life in the city is hard and bad things happen and people have arguments on a street corner and um people stab other people because they they uh, gambling game went wrong or something but also some of those problems will be coming from the big um the big overarching danger that's that's uh, affecting the corner and um so this in that case the struggle between the two factions will be 
causing specific problems to appear on the corner through the trouble engine and these problems will just fester and they will get worse and it'll be up to the players to deal with whatever um this problem is maybe this this building has been um has been shut down and is about to be um demolished but there are people living there and they want to uh, continue living there and there's no reason for it to be demolished and it's because these two factions are having some kind of argument over planning permissions mm -hmm. and so it might take a a series of missions to stop the demolition but then figure out what happened behind the scenes and then find the decision makers and shake them down you might have to travel to the other side of the city to knock on the right doors or kick in the right doors to find the answer to what's happening in your little corner of the city and and sort it out and the whole time that you're running these missions to try and stop these these problems from overtaking your corner and the trouble engine is continuing to make things worse and um yeah you're you're fighting against this this rising tide of trouble um yeah it's a it's a it's a difficult challenge to um kind of overcome the big danger but i i think that should deliver a great sense of satisfaction when you can sort out what that first problem was that you started together as a as a group at character creation time and um get to the end where your corner is safe from that big problem uh, ideally we haven't had no one's no one's played through the whole campaign yet from beginning to end um but our expectation is that it will feel very satisfying when you get there all right and since you since you mentioned factions i'd like to i'd like to go into a bit of that since obviously the factions are going to play a role in terms in terms of who likes you who hates you and who and and who forgot about you um what I'd, uh, and obvious, obviously, obviously, trying to go through, trying to go through all of, through, all of them would be, all of them in detail would would be a bit, um, would be a bit tricky. But I think we, I think we can, I think we can go, I think we can go a bit into the, the um, g the g the gist of the different types of factions, since there's obviously mm. a lot, and going through yeah. all of them would be. Yeah. Um, would be would be would be redundant um mm -hmm. so in, instead I'd, instead i'd like to go over the ma the major theme with each um with each overall category yeah sure um so i'll st i'll start off with the trusts mm -hmm. so the trusts are um in the first edition of of a state they were they were called corporations mm -hmm. and when we were revisiting the, for the second edition um we we looked at kind of the structure of those and it felt it, it kind of it reminded us too much of cyberpunk and the associations that you have of these big cyberpunk corporations weren't quite right for um the environment of a state and um so we've we've called them trusts which is something kind of from the the gilded age the early industrial age where these big um kind of mercantile power houses were basically um, operating massively independently to to assert their authority over people's lives and were kind of providing um, uh, cradle to grave experiences for their workers where um, they would they would provide worker housing and their laborers would come in and they would work in these factories and they would go to these houses and um, they would uh, like eat in the in the trust provided canteens and so on so um the whole the whole th uh, whole arc of life was being managed by these enormous trusts and and at the same time they would be um just exploiting the environment and exploiting their workers and um battling with each other for preeminence in this this um absolutely lethal showdown because um there was no there's there's no possibility for growth in the city there's no um kind of chance to to uh just keep expanding and everyone can lift each other up it's a struggle for dominance so the trusts are absolutely tooth and nail trying to overcome each other and uh that's because the the stakes are very real if one of them's going to get ahead then someone else has to fall behind mm -hmm. um so yeah that's that's what the trusts are they're just giant um corporation style things but more in the and the style of kind of the the early 1900s and what um what industrial um powerhouses looked like back then yeah 
I I got you. I can I got gotcha. you. So next would be the governing powers. Yeah. Well, the big the big governing power in the setting is um, the Three Canals Authority, the TCA, um, who govern the Three Canals metropolitan area, the TCMA. So there are two very very similar acronyms scattered throughout the book, and we all need to make sure that we have the right acronym in the right spot. Um, so that's just one big chunk of the city that is managed by this authority. Um, it's a it's a governed area. It's it's a pretty functional government. Um, there are elected representatives. Um, there's a big council. They make decisions. They look after civic services, etc. They work with the trusts who are working, um, kind of overarching over the whole city. Um, so it's it's a picture of what government looks like, but it's a government that is a bit um, it's it's thoroughly compromised. Basically, it's a huge bureaucracy. It's slow to move. Uh, it's very resistant to change, and it um, it's very well. As an example of one of the the key um, struggles that's happening in the in the game as described, the, there's a borough called Meyer End which is just outside the Three Canals Authority. It's just across a canal from this place. And Myrend has no government. It's basically an, an anarchic situation. There's criminals that run the place. There's a lot of extreme poverty there. There's extreme hardship. And people desperately want the Three Canals Authority to extend its authority just over, over the canal so that they can get on top of the crime and the difficulties they can get some civic services in. they can get some ability to look after each other and look after themselves and the three canals authority is just not doing it so it's a huge bureaucracy and no one really knows why maybe it's because they don't um they don't have the right forms in the right places in this kind of byzantine brazil movie style mm -hmm. um yeah, it's all kind of frozen in the bureaucratic mess. It might be that. It might be that there are people in powers that are getting paid off by the uh, criminal groups to make sure that Myren stays under the control of criminals because um, it's quite handy for people in power within the governed area to keep this little lawless territory outside themselves. So there's all kinds of stuff that's operating inside this, this broken government, basically. But um, it's just functional enough that those within it feel feel pretty lucky. Um, yeah, so that's that's the big governing power, and there are a lot of other little small governing powers, but um, those are that's the big one for sure. Uh, all right. So ne next would be law enforcement. Yeah. So law enforcement um, is, of course, it comes out of the governing powers. Um, it's a, an expression of that, but it's at the level that um, the players of the game are going to encounter on a fairly regular basis, probably. Um, so the Three Canals Authority has um, a police force, effectively called the Provosts, who, um, yeah, they they range from um, kind of being quite supportive of the community, but a bit ineffectual, to being kind of outright fascists, depending on which corner of the city you're looking at and which... Um, NPCs are in charge of that little section. Um, so yeah, the provosts are, are, are trouble. Um, the other main group that you see quite a bit are the transit militia who are attached to the train systems that run through the city. And that's they um, are completely independent of the provosts um, and they have their own militia, the transit militia, who roam the train stations and the trains looking for people who are um, dodging, paying the, the um, fare, for their tickets and uh, punishments can be extremely intense for anyone who has dared to ride the train without paying for a ticket. Mm -hmm. um, so the transit militia are uh, widely, um, widely hated and much feared. Oh, all right. Next would be the faiths. Yeah, so the faiths are a big part of A-State. There is a, a lot of religious belief that runs through this city. Um, the the biggest church is uh, the Church of God, the Architect, the Third Church of God, the Architect, and um, this this is a um, it's a very old-fashioned uh, kind of high church structure. There are um, cardinals and deacons, and they have 
um, these elaborate uh, rituals and prayers that they say, and there are songs that they sing, and um, they wear distinctive clothes, etc. And a huge proportion of the city fall in with this church and um, follow its beliefs and its um, its uh, teachings. But that said, um, the vast majority of the people that follow the teachings of the church don't actually follow it that closely. Uh, much like in, in the real world, when you look around at um, how people relate to organized religion, there's there's a great deal of um, people finding their their own their own paths and their own relationships with uh, with a organized church. So um, the the third church is a very powerful organization, and it can call upon a huge amount of support around the city. But at the same time, you wouldn't um, expect everyone to live up to those high ideals of good morality down on street level just because they go along to um, the church at the end of the week. Mm-hmm. And with and with that with that in, with that in mind, the next one that next one they have is of course the criminal. Um, yeah, so the criminal factions are uh, they're very strong, very strong um, operating throughout the city. The um, most uh, well known of the um, groups is the Holder Gang. Um, which is kind of a, a bit of a bit of a mafia setup run by um, one guy, the Holder family. Um, the elder of that family is kind of pulling the strings, and he's got a bunch of um, people around him who have deputies and lieutenants, and they set up their own little local gangs around the place, and they run all of the organized crime things that you could imagine, um, and run hold a lot of power throughout the city. Um, but they're always in um, warfare against some of the other organizations. There's another group called the Third Syndicate who are um, um, much more uh, mysterious organization. Their leadership structure is much more opaque um, and their purposes are, um, are not as obvious, whereas the Holy Gang is pretty obviously just kind of accumulating wealth wherever they can extract it from vulnerable communities. The Third Syndicate are um, running kind of larger larger schemes against bigger targets and um they're in ruthless ruthless combat with the holder gang when they um end up in a territorial overlap uh yeah there's a few other um other criminal groups that are of note in the city but those two are the are the two that you'll encounter most often i think mm-hmm. so and la- la- last but certainly not least the guilds and unions yeah, so the guilds and the unions are um, all throughout the city. A lot of hmm, what's what's the right way to talk about this? Um, so much of a state is built talking about kind of ordinary people because you're talking about your your corner, your little community, and your community is built on um, the working folk, and so. Um, there will almost always be unions in place and guilds in place that are organized around the workplace. So um, union membership is quite common in the city and those unions can become quite influential. Um, Some of the the unions that are related to some of the locations that will be revealed in in the main core book, they've almost become little governing powers in their corner of the city because they've they've acquired so much influence around there um so the unions that that gather people from the factories to work um to not to work for them but to um sign up with them so they can advocate in their interests they are uh, generally a force for good for the working people but certainly not always there's a lot of corruption that runs through the unions it's very easy for them to be bought off by um, the bigger powers and uh, there's a lot of squabbling between different unions so um, yeah as much as when you go down this faction list a lot of it seems like different groups that are going to cause problems for your corner and here's finally one that's not going to cause problems for your corner well unfortunately they they are going to cause problems just in a different way to all of the other ones because um yeah just like in the real world unions can get captured and compromised and uh those effects get felt Mm -hmm. now i do want i do want to take this time to congratulate you for um 
met for managing to managing to raise about um, fifty three thousand pounds and ch and change um, during the course of the campaign. Thank you. Yeah, um, it was um, it was a it was a great campaign. Um, crossing fifty three thousand pounds was a uh, nine hundred ninety ninety one. I think it was back as um, mm -hmm. just an amazing show of support. It's um, uh, yeah, we were we were absolutely delighted with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, what what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Oh, now that I'm afraid I I have to um leave to my betters um i know that uh john who is running handiwork games has his eye very closely on delivery timetables and that we have um, an ambitious plan to get the game into shape pretty soon so we can get a pdf out to people um it's i, I know that john prides himself on uh, delivering high quality material and also not leaving leaving customers waiting for too long so um, I'm expecting that we will be uh, having some strong meetings over the next few days to um, get everything lined up. And I can also say that the game is its in a pretty good state. It just kind of needs to be pulled together um, and assembled into, into one thing. Um, so it's not a huge amount of work that's ahead of us, but we want to do it right and we want to do it justice. So... Um, I cannot give any indication of what the release window is going to be. Maybe, maybe you could email John, and he might have something more to say about that. Um, but I can say that it's it's very achievable. The game is uh, very close to done, mm -hmm. and I'm really excited to get it finished and get it out to people. Yeah, and I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how it how it um, sh how it shapes out once when the time comes. Yeah. But with that with that said. I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and once again braving time zone hell to come all the way up to the temple and enjoy the madness at play here. It's wonderful to to visit the temple, um, and it has it has been a bit mad, but uh, time zone hell just uh, brings us all into the madness a little bit. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's been it's been a joy. Thank you, Mildred. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, I will, I will definitely raise a glass in the, in the name of the temple. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>